from Wakefield in West Yorkshire, educated as a mining surveyor and as a chartered mining engineer. Was colliery manager in Doncaster in Scotland <coughs> and in Scotland in the 1990s. He became interested in astronomy from an early age due to having a bedroom with no roof and later started with binocular observing until he got his first serious telescope in 2004. He became a member of Mixer and Swinton Astronautical Society in 2006 and everything went downhill from there. A visit to his late cousin, a Christina Rosanna Devi, um, a Master of Astrophysicist at Keele University in 2002, permitted his first observation of the sun in hydrogen alpha light and from then on he was totally hooked. He bought a PST in 2005 when the weather was permitting he has made daily solar observations as part of the BAA solar observing program. He started imaging in 2009 and made the front cover of the BAA yearbook for 2011. He has had articles published in Astronomy Now and the BAA Journal, together with about 40 articles in electronic magazines. He was the first guest in the Let's Talk, in the Let's Talk Astronomy video series in 2011, shortly before he moved to southern Spain. He's proficient in outreach activities in both English and Spanish and had his first article in Spanish published in November 2013 and recently has had his first book accepted for publication in English and Spanish, English and Spanish languages. He has posted hundreds of solar activity animations on space weather and achieved their front page. He's also gained permission from the head of the Global Oscillation Network Group programme to use their data from seven separate sites to make movies of solar activity and house them on his, the solarexplorer.net website that is run since 2010. So please put your hands together and give a good welcome to Andrew Bidevi. Okay, thank you for that, Steve. So what we will do uh, is we will put Andy front and center. Okay, Andy, is that you? Yeah, can you see that? I can. Okay. Well, it, what I cleverly did there, I sent that to Steve and he's just done all talk for me. Right. Okay, we've got your uh, PowerPoint running, filming a solar cycle. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you tonight about a couple of journeys. One, a journey to solar astronomy and another one, journey down to southern Spain. Um, I want to show you a lot of things that the... Uh, the sun can put on show for us, but also let's have a bit of a laugh as well. Um, I'm trying not to be too dictatorial because uh, from what I've heard, Spain's had enough dictators for the last century, so uh, we'll, we'll keep it as light as we can. Okay, so we're gonna be talking about filming solar cycle 24. Okay, first things, why solar astronomy? Well, for me, there's four aspects to that. It's an opportunity to study the life cycle of a star in great detail. The sun is the, by far the largest and obviously it's by definition it's the most dynamic object as well in the solar system. The shifts are better for your health. And also you've got a higher consumption or generation of vitamin D in your body. Um, that's unless you're in observatory doing it. Okay. I'll talk a little bit about the solar cycle. The solar goes from low to high intensity activity with um, an average of 11.3 years between cycles, but also it flips polarity. So the actual solar cycles themselves, till you come back to start are a little over 22 years. Now, the first record of the solar cycle, which this number 24 relates to, uh, it was to cycle 21, which was between 1755 and 1766. And uh, 
the discovery by Johann Wolf, and he published in 1852 based on uh, Schwab's uh, observations. And um, the first solar drawing ever done, I believe, was by Thomas Harriot in 1610, but uh, he never published. And I believe the reason for that is because he had a relative that was implicated in the gunpowder plot. So he decided to keep his head down before he lost it. And that, that's one that Alan Chapman told us at one of his uh, lectures many years ago. Okay, so I'll show you my equipment progression. The first telescope I used for solar observing was actually a um, 250 mil Orion reflector. And uh, I built a plastic card and barred a filter paper reflector for the objective end of it. And this I prepared ready to watch the transit of Venus back in June 2006. And it was a lovely cloud free day and I watched it from virtually end to end and drew everything. But at the time I wasn't doing any imaging and uh, it was before I, I became a member of the society. So a uh, bit of a lone wolf at that time. Okay, so the year after we got this live sunspot complex on 25th, uh, sorry, 20th of January 2005, which was five days before I got my PST. <clears throat> so I had high hopes of seeing this and were actually cloudy for the next three months, so I saw nothing. And uh, I'm sure you can all identify uh, buying new astronomy equipment and having to wait months before you can use it. We've all been there. So my first imaging attempts, I was actually using a pocket digital camera. So this, the left-hand image is a hydrogen alpha image and the right-hand image is a calcium K image. And the bright area to the top left were actually a B2 flare, which were originating at that time from sunspot. 956. Now every image I do I date stamped and in the early days I will put in BST but everything else you'll see tonight has been stamped to universal time and I tend to rotate my videos so that they're at correct solar orientation so they are a useful scientific record. If you don't put the date and time you've got a pretty picture but it's not of any real value so any imaging you do, particularly solar, make sure you've got the date and the correct time when you do it. And if you can, or the correct solar orientation. Okay, so that was a uh, C9 flare, so just under M class flare, see the bright area at the top. And years after, I put the images together. Sorry, that's, that's the uh, calcium K version of it. Then year after, and this is the first animation of any solar data I took. Um, the image is a different size slightly, um, but you can see the flare giving off uh, dynamic activity. And I actually gave myself one out of 10 and must do better for that one. Okay, I then put my triple solar telescope together and basically with a wooden frame on an EQ5 with a 70 mil Skywatcher and a 40 mil PST hydrogen and calcium telescope together. What you see there is if, if you're out solar observing you've got to shield your laptop so I was using a simple cardboard box here but at the time I was using a research grade astrophysics trampoline to stand it on. Okay, that triple uh, solar telescope actually fit into a, um, a small carrying case and that was sufficient dimensions and weight to go into the uh, main hold on an aeroplane. So everywhere we went on holiday, that went with us. And my old joke was, I'm going on holiday, I've got three telescopes and one pair of shorts. 
Okay, so that's just a, a show in uh, on holiday. And what I can tell you is, particularly if you're interested in outreach and, and like to have a laugh and joke with people, you get to know everybody at the hotel if you take something like that with you. Okay, so I did a bit of an article about it in um, the uh, 2019 Astronomy Now. And if you look at the picture bottle uh, in the middle at the bottom, that's a frame that I made out of aluminium and, uh, and a, basically a, a plumbing connector that the digital camera screwed into. And I've got a, a camera umbilical for taking the picture without uh, disturbing the telescope. And the other advantage with it was with the, uh, sorry, with the calcium K telescope, it's very difficult for many people optically. So if you put a digital camera in, they can see a beautiful crisp purple image in, in, uh, in calcium K. The picture on the left shows you that when we used to do our outreach for Mexburn and Swinton, and we often used to get a queue of people wanting to observe with that system. Okay, I'm still using the same equipment. The telescope's now an 80 millimeter Williams optics. Um, I've double stacked the PST, made a, a plastic card sun shield, and I've increased the size of the focus knobs uh, on addition and stuck a clinometer on the side of it. But I still use that, and it's here in front of me on a daily basis. Ma mainly, they are my observational uh, for either my drawings or other data I take. And I send hydrogen alpha data on a, on a monthly basis to, to BAA for the observing program, which has been running for about 160 years. So I then did a bit of an upgrade. So as you can see here, I've gone from a, a simple wooden fence to a proper concrete post and wooden insert fence. So uh, it tied it garden up a lot. Now the, the telescopes is the uh, EQ6. I put a TOA 130 onto it and made the bracketry. So the top one you can see there is a 90 millimeter solar max calcium K. And the bottom one is the hydrogen alpha version of the same telescope with a, a bespoke, very early double stack system stuck onto it uh, at the front. So uh, it's actually triple stack. So I'm actually down to about 0 0.4 of an angstrom with that in the hydrogen alpha range. The other thing you can see on the left is the observing box, which stands on a, um, a Black & Decker Workmate, keeps it nice and stable. It, had a, it has a solar panel on the front, and in the other side of it, there's a little fan, and it also has a, a cloak that fits onto it with Velcro so that you can, uh, you can stay under cover while, while you're imaging. Because to, you need to be able to make sure you're still on focus and also um, you, you can enjoy observing what you're imaging. For the imaging, I, I, I've always used DMK cameras, initially a, a DMK 21 and then um, more lately a D, DMK 51, which is a, a much, much wider field of view. Okay, as we mentioned in the introduction, got that cover picture uh, for an image I took in April 2010. Now that's the coronal mass ejection leaving the sun and you'll see an animation of that later. But to give you a rough idea of scale, its height is the distance of the earth to the sun and its length is double that same distance. Sorry, the, the earth to the moon and its length is uh, double that same distance. Huge, huge uh, feature, one of the biggest things I've ever seen. Okay, that was then part of this, we mentioned the Let's Talk Astronomy program, which is still free for people to see, or film at um, Rother Valley Optics with Dennis Ashton. We, we, we set it up and it was actually all done in one take, no edits, so it, it just ran. Now, the reason for that is, as you'll see here, that's a behind the scenes setup. 
And the microphone there, as you'll see, is above Dennis is above Dennis's head. And and the one they had above me was a high voltage taser to keep me in check. But it didn't work. Okay. I'm, I'm hoping you can see these animations running. What what we've done tonight, we've, we've done some run-throughs. Now, some of the animations I do are very, very large data files, some as big as plus 100 um, megabytes. So they've all been shrunk down to about three megabytes. So there's going to be some loss in clarity, but hopefully you'll be able to see a smooth running uh, animation. But what I'll do at the very end of the talk, I'll show you the parts to my website where you can actually go in and have a look at the originals. You might have to wait a few seconds for them to download, but you can see all, all the, the large high resolution stuff that I do. So that one made front, front page of Space Weather and it was filmed on the 8th of September 2011. This is another one um, that was an M6 class flare, hopefully it's running okay, which was a side blast. And if you look carefully, over the top of that blast, you can see some dark arcs, and they are actually post layer loops above it. Now, I believe that that was used in one of the BAA presidential addresses, uh, but I, I didn't attend, I was just notified. So that particular sunspot uh, was one of the two most active sunspots of the last solar cycle, uh, cycle 24. And that was AR1302. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to show you a couple more animations on that one. Um, that gives you the universal time of it. From uh, So what you're seeing there is only 11 minutes, sorry, 12 minutes. So uh, very, very fast action, that one. This was the same sunspot the, the, day, the day after. And again, only a short animation because unfortunately, you, in England, you're always looking for cloud gaps uh, sufficiently long enough to do a, an animation room, or I seem to be at that time. And then there's a couple of C-class flares here. Andy, yeah. Go back to the previous slide. Right. And can you, you explain what we're actually looking at, please? Right. You're actually looking at an animation. <laughs> <laughs> no, what, what it is, you're actually getting plasma transferring uh, over a loop and it's, it's going from uh, one, one of the uh, umbral areas to the other, which is one of the very few times I've actually seen that, but that, that's just plasma running along magnetic field lines. Thank you, Andy. Okay, the, uh, the next one is a I think that was a C4 class flare. And then I'll, I'll flick to the next one. That were a larger, that was a, a C6 class flare. And these, as you can see, they're only like 14 minute animations. L later on in the, pr in the presentation, so, some of the animations I've done have been durations of well over six hours, but you, you'll see the activity in just a few seconds. Um, which is obviously the beauty of time-lapse animation. Okay, so getting towards end of 2011, um, huge, huge leap of face, faith, sorry, put house for sale, everything in storage, bought a caravan, bought a van and um, headed down to southern Spain. So what you're seeing there near Almeria is the headland is a place called Cabo de Gata or Cape of the Cat. And uh, our first three months in Spain were on a campsite there and that were used as a, a base for reconnaissance, looking for the second phase, which were an area to, to rent. Uh, the, it was always a plan to rent in the Spanish community to, to learn the language and then from then look, on, look, look for somewhere to, to, to live. Incidentally, the same area, what you can see there, on the 2nd of August, 2027, there will be a total solar eclipse. So put that in your diaries. Our house, we're a bit north of that, so I only get 
So uh, we'll be heading south for totality. Just got to live that long. Okay, so I have some specific goals for Spain. Everything I do is based on specific goals. One was to find the right place to set up a home and an observatory. Another one was to learn the language within two years because I wanted to start doing outreach in Spanish because I really do enjoy outreach. The third one was I had certain requirements of solar activity that I wanted to film that had eluded me in, uh, in the UK. One more post layer loops, coronal mass ejections, which I really enjoy filming. And the other one is, if possible, X class solar flares. And then the other one is once we got a home set up to have some suitable accommodation for friends and his family to come along and visit and enjoy the area, enjoy the sun and have a play and enjoy the equipment. So this is me at the caravan site. Now what I want to demonstrate here is the pre precision engineered counterweight system. Because if you look from left to right, I've got a screwdriver, a rat tail file, an engineer's hammer, a set of mold grips and a hand drill fastened to a battery with some washing line. Now, but when I did that, I was able to save one euro in petrol from the drive down from Spain, from England down to Spain. <laughs> Forgot the weights. <laughs> right, uh, you can just see in, in the... Uh, the box there, uh, the red toggle with a little light and that, that operated the fan which is on the right hand side. Now, the other aspect is you can see front end at caravan, but what I did, I bought a double axle caravan, which we towed down with a, a Renault traffic van. And it, it was really unusual because as we came down, we stopped through France at three places and then twice in Spain. And everywhere we stopped, somebody either wanted me to either tarmac the drive or do some fly tipping for them. <laughs> okay, stop shaking your head, Paul. <laughs> okay, down at Cabo de Gata, I took the opportunity and uh, we did a, a style gazing live event in southern Spain, which I actually publicised on uh, Radio Sheffield because I was a guest on Ronnie Robinson's show. And uh, when, when I introduced him, the, his assistant said, are you driving? He says, no, I'm sat in my caravan. Because <laughs> obviously this will get a reflection of a, of a, of a bit of backlash off of the, the, uh, the inside of the, 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 the caravan. So down then, we did this star game in live. And we actually got 140 participants. Did it in English and German, because back then I was fa fairly reasonable with my German, which I've not really used since. But acid on my left, she, uh, she, she translated, but I prepared all the slides in German anyway, as a prompt. But what we did, we did some solar astronomy through, from sort of tea time. Um, it then stopped for a meal, and one in the bar, he put his, um, his two astronomical dishes on, which were either a sun plate, which were chicken and chips, or a moon plate, which were fish and chips. And when he asked, when he asked me which I wanted, I said, well, before I choose, can you tell me which has got the least amount of space on the plate? <laughs> okay, so that just shows you when you get a, a decent cue uh, for solar astronomy. Now, I think the reason for the the queue, <clears throat> in my basic German, I told them that if I don't get people coming, I'm going to throw the towel in. And it went around that if you come and have a look, you get a free towel. What is joking? Okay, so these are some of the events that I filmed from that caravan site with the PST. Um, the, the image isn't, isn't fully stable because I've not obviously got it polar aligned correctly. Um, something that you can later do in Photoshop, but I was turning out that many animations at that time. I, I just couldn't be bothered. So if you look here, hopefully you'll see a, a very large prominent structure. 
the the size of that structure is much larger than the earth moon distance and if you look there you're seeing just over an hour and a half runtime okay this one here this is a five hour event and the the prominence were very large very faint but some of it escaped so you've actually got the bit a uh, part of that was a coronal mass ejection as I say, it's very fine, but you'll, you'll have to later have a look on my website and you'll see these in, in higher resolution. Okay. This was a M4 class solar flare that basically blasted upwards and it ejected some plasma, but which very quickly fell back. Okay. This one here, we'd moved to a Spanish farmhouse in a, in a Spanish community. Um, and we got so friendly with them that we've actually integrated into the family. And e even though we've moved sort of 30 minutes away, we still see, see well, before the lockdown, obviously, but we, we're still in regular touch. And uh, we've formed really big bonds with that, with that Spanish family. So what you're seeing here is an M2 class flare and just to the right of it, if, if you can see it running carefully, you'll see the ripples and it's, it, that was my first image of a solar shock wave. Okay, another very large prominence. When, when you see the dynamics, you, you, many of these things rotate and that one like a huge tornado um, on, on the, the sun's limb. If you look very carefully along the edge, you'll see little, like little things jumping up and down. They are spickles. And the trick I've done here is I've overexposed the surface of the sun. So you see in detail within the prominence because against, against the, uh, the surface of the sun, they're quite dim, quite often quite dim. Okay. So. What I'm showing you is a map of southern Spain and the three arrows are actually pointing to the crest of the Sierra Fibrales Ridge or mountain range. They go up to uh, over 2000 meters. That's Calar Alto Observatory. I've actually got a couple of friends and contacts that work up there. So I can generally now say that I've got friends in high places. <laughs> Stop shaking your head, Paul. <laughs> okay, that's me. And that's Trevor. As you can see, we're quite close together. Geographically, I think it's about 35 kilometers, maybe 40 kilometers from our house to the observatory. It is the largest observatory in mainland Europe. At the moment, they're, they're looking for ex ex extrasolar planets with the system. They've got a three and a half meter telescope, which I'll, I'll speak to you a little bit more about shortly. That's the, the dome of one of five domes. That's the main telescope, the three and a half meter. That dome is 43 meters tall and 30 meters in diameter. It's funded by the Institute of Astrophysics in Spain and also the Max Planck Institute of Germany. That mirror there, as you can see above Julian and myself, that's 3.5 meters diameter and it weighs 12 tons. There's 12 tons of glass in that. The whole telescope is above 150 tons and it tracks with an accuracy of 0 0.1 of an arc second, which in layman's terms, if you stood on a mountain ridge or somebody stood on a mountain ridge 40 kilometers away from where you're sat, it would stay within the rim of a one euro or a one pound coin that you're holding in your hand. That's how, how sophisticated the tracking is on it. Now, as you can see, it is limited access. There's cameras everywhere. So absolutely no use whatsoever for shaving. Okay, so our permanent home, altitude 360 meters. 
it's an old mining village near a town called Bedar. So Sod's Law, a mining engineer, finishes up in a mining village, isn't it? So somewhat I'll come back to a bit later on. We're five minutes away from the A7 motorway, 15 minutes from the coast, 35 minutes away from El Maria Airport, only 15 minutes from gym, and it's one of the best gyms in Spain. 300 days of sunshine and almost five five hours of uh, night duting. Oh, that's the first time I've noted that. Sorry for the uh, misspelling there. If Barry's watching, he'll, he'll pick up on that one. So that, that should have said during the uh, midsummer. So not a lot going for it, really. Okay. That's, this is ours with uh, the crest of a ridge. Now, on the resolution, you can't quite see the, uh, the name of the house, but when we came, I renamed it to Casa del Sol. I think, I think the original owner, he may also have been of interest in astronomy because he called it Casa Nova. Okay, first thing I built, week one. There's a steel pier in there, it's well camouflaged at that time. Um, filled with concrete and I've got my uh, observing table and box so within the very first week I were imaging. Okay, I then started clearing the area, flattened it, I got a, a big heavy duty uh, jigger pick or some people call them jackhammers but I call it a jigger pick, leveled it all off, concreted some five meter long uh, steel rails in and what you can see there is the base of the observatory and two sides laying on top. And note the expert camouflage of the pier. Okay, this is me and my mate Robin. We are building the observatory there, which is an eight foot cube. So when it's in the forward position to the left, it's completely covered. I lift the floor out undo those turnbuckles and the whole observatory runs backwards on those rails. The observatory itself weighs about three quarters of a ton because when you look inside it's got all rebars in every seven inch so it basically it's reinforced like a tiger's cage. There are other security things to it as well which I'll lock me up for discussion. Okay. This is me and my little mate, bless him, Alfie, who no longer with us. Um, typical observing session. I either sat out in the table and uh, used my observing box, or which, which, which is basically at that position, I can put my, my hands straight on, on the focus knobs. Because um, when you start imaging, as your telescopes start getting warmer, the, uh, you have to keep adjusting focus uh, uh, every, every few minutes. Or if it's silly hot, I'm inside and I've got a huge fan in there as well. Okay, as you can see there, that's the uh, my southern view, um, due south. There's, there's no houses or settlements for about six kilometers, five or six kilometers in, in my southern view. Um, the battery pack purely for backup because Spain at one time were notorious for having short power cuts but that seems to resolve itself four or five years ago and I've never needed battery pack since. And then four, I think it was four years ago I upgraded and that's a uh, one of the EQ8 mounts. Um, much more suited because it has actually got a, a carrying capacity of 50 kilos, which is more or less the same weight as the telescopes. Before I'd put an extended bar on the uh, EQ6 and uh, it, you had to keep it in balance because it was severely overloaded, which I've still got it, it's still serviceable. Okay, a few things there. That's the Mexper and Swinton Plaque Southern Observatory. Uh, Southern European Observatory sign. We've got a, I've got a, um, a laser finder. That's 
a guide scope, guide camera, which is interesting. If, if somebody remember last week, nobody could see me and what, what, what was actually happening, the Zoom were actually trying to use my guide camera rather than the camera off the PC, which were fine, but the problem was is every time I tried to move my head, it was correcting me and putting me back in the same position. There's only the images I'll understand that one. And then down there is the video camera. Okay, and this is my um, expertly organized wire handling system, as you can see. Same as the fishing reels used to be years ago. Okay, so this is, this is our southern view. You can see the west, which is just other side of the pool, that's where my observatory is. But uh, at the, that's the center of the telescopes and the observatories run backwards. That there is a, a secondary pier I put in that when, when his friends come over with stick uh, EQ6 on them, all, all the redundant telescopes for, for visual stuff. And then this is just an example of our skies before um, there are any modifications done to the street lighting, which is a story I'm going to come on to shortly. But you can see, we can see Sagittarius and Scorpius with 17 degrees further south than where we were to Mexborough. So um, at 37 degrees north, you get in the southern skies and galactic center. If you look at the mountains at the bottom, you can see there's a bit of an orange tint and they, that were due to a bit of sodium light pollution we're getting from the street lights in village. Um, that were a 20 second exposure, that one. So what I did was project street lights, which were May 2017. You can see an example of the street lights that we got on the right, which were 150 watt sodium bulbs, and there were 102 of them in the village. So as I argued, the, the light had come all those millions of light years to be ruined by some lights four meters above the ground. So I wrote a series of technical papers in Spanish for our mayor, which then got taken to the deputation provisional of Al, Al, Al Maria which I suspect may have had his name on at that stage and not mine. Um, he was able to get the funding to change the street lights. So this is me doing a talk on the top left to the whole village. Because basically we have a residence association over here and I thought, well, if we get everybody on board, that has more weight to it. But when I was able to demonstrate that, that going from a 150 watt sodium down to a, a 40 watt LED gave you a small saving of just 83% on your electric bill, which for the village was 6,000 euros a year. Uh, we got some action. Now, the image you can see on the top right uh, during the transition, so you can see the new lights, and to the left were the last five of the old ones. You see the very bright ones. And I've shown you the picture at the bottom because that's only 10 days ago and that's van and contractors changing last of them. And it's, I, I had to wait, unfortunately, the, the ones that affected me most actually turned out to be the last five that they changed, but it's all done now. So did it work? Well, all I can tell you is it all counts for nothing because now we get a shed load of light pollution from Milky Way. Okay, I'm going to have to jump presentations now, so just bear with me a second. So hopefully we can go on to part two. What, what I did, I, I split these up just in case uh, PowerPoint had become unstable. So uh, let's see if it works okay from the beginning. So part two, what I'm going to concentrate on now is some of the more dynamic solar activity that I've filmed so far. So I've split these into different types of events. So, and bear in mind, you've seen the low resolution version, so I'm just fingers crossed that they're on for you. Okay. 
That's the huge event that I filmed from 13th of April. And I don't know if it's running or sticking that one, but um, its height, as I say, it started the Earth to the Moon distance. And you can see that that, uh, that animation was only 11 minutes, uh, sorry, sorry, 31 minutes there of, of animation. In between that, I took a calcium K image as well, because at that time I was just taking stills. I, I weren't, uh, weren't on the animation track at that stage. Okay, this one's filmed with a PST. Hopefully this running all right. On, on the outer rim, um, over half a million miles in height, as you can see, it's, it's just disappearing out into space. So hopefully that's running okay for you. They're coming across this, well. Yeah, this one here, this is a three and a half hour event that I filmed. The, the, I did do a cropped image to get rid of the white line on the top, but I've, I've left all of the data in here just to, so you can see just how these things lift off. So normally, if you're solar imaging and there's anything big on the edge, film it because it's definitely unstable. And if you're lucky, it will leave and, and form a, a coronal mass ejection. This one here, the scene was better on this one. And if you look with crisper scene, you can, as well as seeing the main event, hopefully you can see all the spickles jumping up and down um, at the same time. Next feature I want to show you is, and, and this was another one that I wanted to film, which was pulse flare loops. You've already seen this one filmed with the PST. So if anybody's got a PST and you can stick a, a black and white um, webcam into it, have a go. If you look there, I, I was filming that for three hours and 14 minutes. And that had actually followed a uh, M7 class solar flare. Now, it went on for a lot longer, but unfortunately I'd got family over, so I had to pack up at that point. We went down to the beach. I'll let that one run. This one's just a, a single loop, quite, quite a short transient one, that one. Just over an hour, that one. 11.45 to 12.51 UT. This one here, what you'll see here is the six, six and a half, oh, well, just short of six and a half hour animation. Because the loops were very faint, I've had to overexpose the surface. But that, I find that one fairly hypnotic. I love this animation. I was actually filming with two um, two times Barlow's in, so the, I was actually at 3.2 meter focal length of the Hadron Alpha Telescope when I filmed this, which is this is, a, is as much as I'll push it for a, a 90 millimeter telescope. Okay, this one here, it's an M class flare. But you can see that as the flare subsides, you can see the loops forming afterwards. Well, I hope you can. Again, just over an hour's duration, 12.35 to 13.36 universal time. I've actually rotated that one from the side of the limb, just, just purely for display purposes for tonight. Okay, so. You can also have a look white light animations. Now, if you can do a long enough run on a sunspot, if you very carefully watch the penumbral area where the fibrils are, 
you can see the like fingers running in very slowly run in now that one there is a roughly a 45 minute animation what i found with white light is it's, it's very sensitive to atmospheric scene because obviously you're getting all, all all the different lights in rather than just very narrow band either hydrogen alpha or calcium k so you can see when when the scene's good it's sharp when it drops off a bit um obviously you can see when the scene deteriorates that's another one i think the scene will generally a little bit better what, what i normally do as well when i post an image I'll, I'll, i need to make a comment on the scene conditions as well again you can if you look if you look mainly at the well all of them some spots you can see the plasma running in towards the umbral area Another one, large sunspot, um, half hour animation. To, to see real moment, you need to be an, above an hour in, in white light to see any real moment on them films. Okay, and this is just me showing an enlargement where you can see the granulation cells bubbling. I've got a project to do a, a much better when, with that though. Uh, over this coming year. Okay. Um, this one I'm showing you here is a, a white light animation of Sunspot AR 2192, which is the largest sunspot in the last 30 years. Now, it was just coming on limb there on the 19th of October, which, which was the first day we could fully see it, and we thought, oh my God, there's a monster coming here. So, what you'll see next is a, a white light still image and you can compare its physical size to what the normal sunspots that we would see and this sunspot complex was much bigger than the planet Jupiter and in a few minutes I'll come to show you how we measure features on the sun so calcium K this one a few days later, same sunspot. This one on the uh, 24th of October, 2014, at uh, 09.52 Universal Time. And you can see the large uh, structures in calcium. And also you can see the detail or you, in, in the um, sunspot itself. So next, I'm gonna show you an animation from that day in calcium K, and you'll see a couple of little flares running in, in calcium if it's running okay. There's one, there's one directly below the main spot, and there's one to, uh, to the uh, north east position. Okay, big filaments. So this is this is the uh, one I shrunk down from 100 megs down to three. Now, what I've done there, it looks odd, but one of the techniques that we use, and I'm not a massive fan of it normally, is to invert the images, and particularly with filaments, it helps to uh, to pick them out. So you're seeing a uh, a very very long filament. That filament is actually above a million kilometers long. Which I'll come, I'll come to shortly. And uh, you're seeing that there's only very, very slow plasma transfer along it. So I mentioned measuring solar features. This is a solar ruler. Um, it was developed by a guy I know, a French guy called Guy Burry. And uh, working with him, we got the, uh, the English version. But basically, you just either overlay it on your full disk image or your partial image, and you can see you've got features there. You've got the scale that runs across the center, not in the middle, and they are 100 kilometer distance marks. And then, so if you look, that filament, the white, long white thing at the, uh, that runs across at the bottom, it goes from 
more than 400 kilometers to the left through the through zero and then up as much as 600 so not kilometers 600,000 kilometers to the right it's also got the, the you see the little black dot that's the scale of the earth and then the, the circle is jupiter and then on the right hand side you see the the line that's got the earth moon distance so very very good for measuring solar features now if you very very carefully look at if it was a clock face nine o'clock you see a very faint sort of prominence there which is between the first and second lines which puts it about 75,000 kilometers in height so it's also used for measuring prominence as well very very useful tool okay this is a, a filament that wasn't quite a lift off not quite a cma there's a a flare that it seems to send a white shock wave up into the filament which breaks and then as you can see reforms and then if you're very lucky you may find that catch another cme from the filamentary aspect so this one here is, is about a 700,000 kilometer filament it had been on the sun I think it, I think this one had done three cycles and I was so lucky that while I was filming this one as you can see over a 20 minute period from 1412 to 1432 universal time it lifted off so there you've got a, a CME on its way out towards well towards us shock waves well one of the other things I like to do is full disk images. If you do a particular long one of six or seven hours, you can see the solar rotation. Uh, here, there's a very long filament. There's a, I think that was an M2 class flare, and you'll see a shock wave running from the center of the sun in a, a northeast direction. Uh, or basically up towards two o'clock if it were a clock phase. Now this next one is not mine. This is actually data taken from GONG, the Global Oscillation Network Group, which I'll come on to a bit later. This was from a an M6, sorry, an X6.5 class solar flare from cycle 23, which I believe were back in 2006. Um, but you can see, you get a big event and you can see this, the, the huge shot wave running along. Okay, so again, another one of my goals were the X class solar flares. So that's the first one I captured. Hopefully you'll see it, see it running. I'm just watching Roy's screen. That's what I'm doing here to see if I can see it running. Or if it's, that, that one might be sticking. As well as the X2 class flare, there's a shock wave that runs directly vertical upwards away from it as well. I'll just leave that one in a bit longer. That one's maybe sticking when I, when I look at it Roy screen there. Okay. This is a X 1.6 flash flare. Again, associated with that very big sunspot, AR 2192. Twenty sixth of August, I caught the back end of an X two point zero class flare. The the area of the flare complex is about twice the diameter of Jupiter. Following day, I caught 
an M7 class flare, and I thought that's probably it for Dave, but sod it, I'll stay with it anyway. And then not long afterwards. Now, what I'm showing you here, and I, I took a, a short video live, which we tried to run uh, to see if we could uh, include it in presentation, but it, this one just gave all sorts of problems. So if you look, you can see me, that's the image that I've got on my laptop. Um, the, the, the half a diameter sun is basically full screen. And uh, that particular laptop I was using there were a 17 inch screen um, at that time. And you obviously can see my reflection, but that's what I see in real time. Obviously nothing seems to be moving a, except for a little bit of atmospheric seeing. Um, but it's, it's exciting and you, you can tell these things are moving, but until you put the animation together, you have just no idea what you're getting. So every time it, it, your, your first animation run, uh, it, it just gives me a huge buzz. Okay, so what I'm showing you now is the actual animation that I run. What I have to do is I have to flip the image through 180 degrees um, to get the solar orientation. So as you can see there, that sunspot was starting to uh, head off towards the edge of the limb. Now, that particular sunspot gave off six X-class flares. I filmed three and the others all occurred, if I remember rightly, during hours of darkness um, from my location. Now, a few years ago, I emailed the Global Oscillation Network Group program to see if I could get their permission to use their data to make animations of the spectacular solar activity that they caught and did nothing about. And I then got a wonderful email back saying, what a, what a wonderful idea. None of us had thought of that. And uh, the program director, a, a guy called Frank Hill, wanted to email me directly, uh, give me permission, and the, the text that I have to include on the page with the images about the credits being their photographs. So what I'm going to show you now is a, a, a series of a few of theirs. Now, this is the GOM data full disk image. I'm just hoping this, this runs. You can see some solar rotation. If you look top right, the, the clock's running. Um, that one was from the Big Bear telescope. That's one of seven telescopes at the monitor. There's Big Bear, there's, um, there's one at, uh, in Chile. There's Tidy, Udipa, one in uh, Australia. Learmonth, and then the other ones on Hawaii. And then this next one you'll see, this was the largest flare associated with that sunspot, which was an X 3.1 class flare. Hopefully you can see them running all right. Again, that flare you see there is getting on towards three times the size of Jupiter. What I've shown you there is, I pulled the data to show you the uh, X-ray flux. So the red line at the top and the peaks, they are the solar flares. The, the, the dark line that some of them peaks are breaking through, that's the, the line between M-class and X-class flares. And there were six of them. And um, this box is telling you the magnitude of those flares. It also delivered, I think, about 19 M plus flares as well. So, Solar Cycle 24, which I've been talking about, started in December 2008, and its end date has been seems to have been put at May 2020. It delivered 47 X plus flares, and the largest was a 9.3. So that didn't actually deliver any super flares that cycle because anything above an X10 is classed as a super flare. Now, 
I believe the largest flare ever recorded was in 2004 on this system, which initially was given an X28 class, but some papers have put it as an X45. Now, luckily, when that went off, it was a limb flare, so the blasts went away from Earth. If it had been pointing towards Earth, uh, dead center, you could have forget, forget your satellite communication systems, something as big as that going up. Okay, so I was lucky enough to film the X 8.1 class flare, which was on September 10th, uh, 2017. That's a uh, just shy of a 50 minute animation and I, I want the last frames I were only a few degrees above the uh, where I start to lose the sun behind the mountains. So uh, I really stuck with it on that one. And what I couldn't do was uh, not show you the largest flare of Solar Cycle 24. So here it is. That's an X9.3. And that, that was filmed um, from El Tide in Spain. And um, I think we were cloudy here that day. For some reason, I missed it and uh, uh, it prevented me having a go at it that day. And uh, done it on its biggest event at the uh, 11.3 year cycle. Okay, just summing up a bit on the cycle, you can see cycle 23 was much, much larger than uh, cycle 24, roughly half the intensity and the consensus of predictions is that the next cycle that we're already in solar cycle 25 is going to be about the same so almost uh, entering on an extended solar minimum period now if you look at the gap at the bottom we see 2020 solar activity has been very very low for at least two years and nearly three so you have to ask what, what a solar astronomer does during the lull. So I've done a little bit of planetary. Hopefully you can see that one. That one in collaboration with a friend of mine, uh, Alexandra Hart, who comes over with her husband. Um, she, I think she's been over a couple of times. Using my telescope, me doing the focusing, um, we had a five times Barlow in. So that were at a five meter focal length and uh, an atmospheric distortion corrector and a point gray grasshopper camera colored. And to achieve that clarity, the scene was pretty good. And we were shooting 5,000 frames uh, sets a time. If we'd have gone any further, we would have started to get blurred and due to rotation of the planet itself. The, uh, the moon is Iho, or as I like to call it, OI. And uh, you can see the shadow to the moon on, on the uh, northern equatorial cloud band. And obviously, you can see a great red spot as well there. This is one I did um, only at four meter focal length in black and white. This is, that's before I, I got a, a colored camera. And then with a colored one. Not particularly a good scene, but this was last time Mars were uh, nice and bright and in opposition. You can, you can see the uh, north and south polar caps here and some rotation on it. Now, Mars has got a side that's almost blank and then another side that, that's quite, um, quite good features. Okay, a little bit on deep sky. Just started to venture a little bit into deep sky. That's the Rosetta Nebula using a modified DSLR camera. That's the only deep sky piece of kit I had uh, at that time. And then some of these you've seen before Eagle Nebula. Because, because we are quite well south, the, these get quite high in the, in the sky. So uh, the scene becomes better. And then uh, just a, a go at um, Ryan Nebula. I have got 
about 30 other projects all at various stages on the laptop which I've not even started processing you're just gathering data so at some stage I'll sit down and probably put them all together all in one day okay we live in a beautiful area so I'm just going to show you a little bit of local wildlife that we get the top left one's for Phil to identify so have a good look at that Phil and I'm going to I'm going to let you tell me when this talk's over Top right, we get a lot of different types of eagles and even vultures patrolling mountain range that we're on. Bottom right, we get a lot of um, wild goats. Some call them ibex, or as the Spanish call them, cabras de la montesas. They're in garden every night. Um, they eat all the splants and ne never pay for anything, but they always leave a deposit. And then uh, if you look on the right hand side, uh, you can see why we actually overrun with tortoises all the time. We get loads and loads of wild tortoise. We get butterflies um, all year round. The, I've, I've often said that the, uh, the winters over here are the best summers I've ever had. Uh, now, also, very, very occasionally we get much more exotic creatures, which I'm going to show you next, visiting this area. Okay, twins, Hemilos. This is something else I'll just briefly touch on it, but this has been a bit of a distraction for the last three years. And there it is. I've done the full industrial and social history of the area together with my mate Juan Antonio, who's uh, actually a professor of medicines at Discard University of Paris, but he's from here. And we've unpicked the whole mining, transport, history, railways, foundries, and all the social history. So this particular project will be published in two editions in Spanish and English, each 384 page lo pages long with nearly 500 photographs and a mere 156,000 words per edition. This is a huge project for Spain and uh, when it's finished this is my gift to the area because it's basically been a full-time job for me for the last three years. Mining engineer, the fact that in the village I'm at we had the, the largest wash plant for minerals in the world and also the largest aerial cable transport system in the world in the decade of the 1880s from the 19th century so just could not resist that and i think i've read through over 5,000 old spanish newspapers to trim it down to 500 inclusions within it so that's all i'll say about that one okay so what's next okay we all saw sean reynolds um, brilliant talk about a month ago, and absolutely stunning images, um, beautiful coloured images. So I thought, Project Hubble Palette. So that's where I've been on me now. This is the first image. <laughs> I'm just looking at Les's face there. <laughs> That's the Yorkshireman doing it on cheap, Les. <laughs> okay. As I say, I've had to shoot the videos down, so I'm just going to very, very quickly show you my website front page, very, very quickly. If anybody wants to email us, there's my email at the bottom. Because uh, after getting attacked by um, a, a Chinese gambling firm, there's no way of contacting us through the website anymore. So, a couple of things. That's the Astrobin page where all the very large animation files are stored. So some of them, when you load them up, you may have to wait a few seconds uh, for, them, for them to play. That's a page I did of the AR2192. Um, got lots of M-class flares, a lot of data on it from that one. If you want to follow any tutorials about the things that 
and the techniques I've used, they're all on that tutorials. There's four pages on that, easy to follow. And then if you're a historian like I know Roy is, there's three pages of solar astronomy books and astronomical publications uh, and general astronomy going back to the year 1128. All Galileo's works are on it. Um, and many others, even Einstein's papers are on. They're all in digital libraries, so I just spent months when I was at that farmhouse on the days it, it, where they weren't particularly good, um, just putting the library together and it's all there. So that's that. So if people are visiting, you know where we are. Uh, what I'm really glad is that the planes are flying again. So this is just to demonstrate that they are. Now, what I've done there, if you look very carefully, I've put them so they're back to back because I didn't want a mid-air collision. And on that note, I've done. <laughs> Thank you very much, Andy. Uh, right, I'll, st I'll stop screen share, shall I, Paul? Uh, yes, please. Okay, I'm going to just go back to gallery mode. And oh, <laughs> well, everybody's got a smiling face. Well, so that's good. They, they obviously have been. It's because it'll be stuck in there and they'll be in shock. <laughs> <laughs> okay, ladies and gentlemen, we've come to that part of the evening where we open up for questions. Uh, as some of us who were uh, logged in before practiced, uh using a digital uh raising of hands if you weren't here and you can't work it out it's down in the participants uh logo and it will allow you to put up a digital hand and we're going to do it like that so first person terry dobson's been really quick so terry can you uh unmute your speaker or microphone rather How we doing? I'm just going to say, Paul, they could ask me any question they want, but I shall not answer. That, that's <laughs> going to be dangerous. All right, Terry, uh, we'll come back to you when you've worked out how to unmute your microphone. Okay, and Lynn. Right, Andy, I want to know why you haven't got a decent Spanish accent by now. <laughs> Me espanol este muy bien. No, oh, no, no problem, it's come the accent up. <laughs> have you got a uh, another question lid or no, <laughs> no that's it. It. it was great to see all your images and your, your movies again brilliant i've got most of them of course on file anyway <laughs> yeah it was just lovely brilliant you do yeah. a great job and it's really good to see how you progress from those early days and how the equipment's progressed and how your skills have it's fantastic do a brilliant job yeah. now fabulous lynn where are you based me, I, I'm, uh, uh, the accent is Yorkshire, but I, I'm up in Scotland. I'm near Brecon, which is kind of near Montrose, between Aberdeen and, and Dundee. Well, you're very welcome this evening. Thank you. Okay, has anybody else got a question? Terry, do you want to try and unmute your microphone okay. again? Okay, Terry. Oh, yeah. Well, there's a Wakefield chap, Andy, myself. Um, the question I was going to ask is exactly the same as what's just been asked. <laughs> <laughs> From an accent point of view, it's uh, I recognise it straight away. Um, and my son's just been in and said, that looks like you, Dad. Um, so I think you've got the same haircut as me then, Terry. Almost, almost. <laughs> I, I did this for charity uh, because my mum and Peter were in hospital with uh, COVID-19. All right. Uh, and I was just uh, amazed at the uh, care that, were, that they had. And um, I decided to cut all my curly locks off uh, and raise a bit of money. So we raised uh, about £650, which was excellent work. E excellent, yeah. So I thoroughly yeah. enjoyed it. But can I just say the presentation, the laughs, the jokes, brilliant. You know, my sense of humour, I loved every minute of it. It was brilliant. <laughs> I'm very new to astronomy. Um, but uh, what I've seen so far, I can tell I'm going to be hooked for a while longer yet. 
Oh, oh yes. Uh, yeah. Get ready. Get ready, Terry. Yeah. Well, thank you ever so much, Andy. Thank you. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm originally a Wakefield lad, born at Charleston, me. Yeah, that's right. I heard that uh, on the on your first uh, comments um, about being at Wakefield. So I thought, I know it was reasonably local because my dad were a miner. He worked at Manor Pit and Walton. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I worked at Charleston. Um, my dad's mate, Frank, Frank Mortimer, he was surveyor at Manor before they shut it, but obviously they've all gone now. Anyway, yeah. we, we, we better stop because there'll be too much coal dust in air. <laughs> too right, yeah. Thank you, no bother. Okay, uh, Trevor. Trevor. Andy. Um, I just Trevor. wondered if there was any other wavelengths of um, light that you image the sun in. You know, you've got your calcium, your visual, um, and HA. I just wondered if there was any other that were interesting. The, 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 there are, uh, but I can't remember them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for <laughs> Have a look at internet. <laughs> right, hang on. Sodium. Sodium and magnesium are the, are the two sort of... In, yeah. In, in, ah, uh, yeah. 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 Uh, you, you can. The so, some people that use spectroscopes and all sorts. Yeah, there are quite a number of wavelengths. Yeah. Uh, the only other question I'm going to ask is, uh, you know, all the data that you've recorded over the years, are you... Yep saving them onto external hard disks then just for posterity or yeah I've, I've, I've got i think i've got over 20 terabytes now uh, yeah um, everything's date stamped and if if, if i ever find a recorder where they can go i'll uh, make arrangements to, for them to be saved ah uh, yeah yeah great it just become a problem though the more data yeah, over yeah. the years there's an interesting point trevor uh, an, an image, an imaging run, you can get um, over 200 gigabytes of data in one, one imaging run, and mm. I think to date I've, I've, I've made well over a thousand copies. I've filmed six X class flares and over a hundred M class flares, so a lot, a lot of stuff. Are you actually monitoring activity on whatever um, websites for pending flares then, or? Yeah, you just... what, what I do is, as well as my daily observation, the space weather, and also um, you can look up x-ray flux, which, which are all on the uh, web links on the website. Yeah. So it gives you an indication if there's going to be any, any activity or not. Yeah, final thing then. I, um, uh, one of my favourite um, astronomers from the past, William Herschel, he noted that... Um, when you got a solar minimum, the weather dramatically changed. Um, I just wondered if you'd um, come across any any findings like that. They're saying, you know, like the Thames froze over and all that stuff. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the thing is, remember, I've been here, I've been in Spain now for eight years. So uh, the, yeah, there's been droughts experienced here. So temperature change isn't going to be a lot, is it? No. This area. Thank you for that, Andy. I'll, I'll mute myself then now, yeah? Paul, you're on mute. Hi, Andy, it's Tony. Hey, Tony. How's things? Very good. Good, good. Couple of questions, then, Andy. Uh, one relating to your, your data storage. Yeah. Uh, I've been I've been going through my very first webcam archives recently. Yeah. And I have I now haven't got the codec to play them back. Oh. So as you know, as your system keeps getting refreshed by whoever Microsoft or whatever. Be careful yeah. your original data can still be played. Right. So the thing is, Paul, uh, Tony, there's, there's not a lot I can do about it, but what, what I've done is all the video sets, initially I used to keep them, but I saved all, uh, um, and the still images. Now I just save, dump the videos after I've uh, refreshed them, so they're just JPEG files that I'm saving now. 
No, that should be that should be good. Yeah, look, yeah. Look, luckily, I've got a really old laptop that still works. But I was saved by the skin of my teeth. And the other one is then, Andy. So, what do you use to process all your images? What software? Okay. Initially, I started with Registax Five, which I've still got. That that will then develop to Registax Six, which most of my uh, videos were they still were, were processed on that. More recently, I, I'm favouring AutoStacker Two. Um, now, what I do with them is I process the image and then you drop it into Registax for your wavelets. And then for the animations, I've just used uh, Photoshop PS5 to, uh, to, to, to make the uh, GIF, GIF files. Yeah, okay. Right, thanks, Andy. Thank you. Okay, Phil Muffet, please. Right, what 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 it, Phil? Oh yeah, all right. Hi. Uh, you can hear me, right? Yeah, but bearing in mind, my question, bearing in mind there's Soho and all these big observatories doing solar observation. Are amateur uh films and results uh making a kind of an, an, any difference to the astronomy scene with, the, with regard to the sun, if you see what I'm saying? Are you contributing right. anything? Or are you just doing it for the enjoyment? Well, there's the enjoyment, but also enthusiasm in people, because if it weren't for enthusiasts, the science missions wouldn't get the money, would they? Mm. So, so there's, that, there's that aspect to it. Um, the thing is, if there's a big flare, some of them in instruments like uh, SOHO or other satellites, it, they might get wiped out anyway, so we'll come well, back to the yeah. So... So there's always that potential, isn't there? It, true, there is. Do, yeah. do you ever use ever use Soho uh, yourself, so you can say, "Ah, oh, there's a good, there's going to be a good some activity today. I'll I'll get my equipment out." Well, there's the. What I tend to do is I look at the um, Agen Alpha ground-based telescopes on the Global Oscillation Network group, Gong. Okay. And if you look on them and and read Space Weather website. Um, they're, they're very good predictions and uh, the other thing I, I do as well is I tend to look at last few days x-ray flux curve because if a, a sunspot might be flaring once every six hours or 18 hours or whatever it, it's not accurate but it gives you a bit of an insight and it seems yeah. so for me yeah it gives you a lead in yeah well, basically we're fishing and then then you decide do I go uh reduce the focal length and go full disc or do I increase the focal length and go and mm. image a, a, a particular area but yeah. what you do is by looking at the animations on the gong site you can tell what's the most dynamic activity for that particular day and what's going to be the best, best thing to image yeah, so, yeah. so you're not wasting your time useful. yeah yeah uh, can I bring Lynn Smith back into the conversation about the use of amateur <laughs> the use of amateur observations for scientific yeah. purposes. Uh, Lynn's hiding uh, the fact that she is uh, connected with the BAA solar section uh, quietly. Uh, just like uh, she's up the director. Hiding, hiding in full sight. So, <laughs> Lynn, uh, you gather data, the solar section gather data, gathers data from amateur observers throughout uh, throughout the year and from all over the world so uh, what happens to that data uh, well two things um, first of all I submit our monthly data um, to the Royal Observatory at Belgium who are responsible for the sunspot number so our data is fed into the, the professionals uh, and then secondly I archive everything so that all these observations are not lost and all Andy's fantastic images and and movies they're all, they're all kept for posterity. So, well, hopefully, anyway, <laughs> depending on how, um, you know, the, we're going to keep everything digitally now. God knows what we'll be doing in 20 years' time. But hopefully it'll all be preserved. A lot of it hasn't in the past. All the paper records from uh, decades ago have got lost over time, which is a great shame. But uh, I've managed to preserve the archive from 1970-odd for the solar section. And uh, hopefully forever more now. Lessons learned. Right, thank you for that. So, Phil, they do get used. 
Well, the, the first sunspot was, was seen and recorded by an amateur, which was Richard Carrington. Yeah, yeah. interesting stuff, yeah. Okay, uh, has anybody else got a question? I can't see any more, Andy. I think uh, people have uh, been... They've gone into shock. <laughs> entertained, ...entertained and informed. So, in our usual Max Brun Swinton Astronomical Society manner, can we say thank you to Andy? Thank 